Welcome to the Birth Launch Podcast, an empowering space for expecting and new parents to hear candid conversations with experts and learn how to craft your ideal birth. Hey y'all, welcome back to another episode of the Birth Launch Podcast. Today we're talking about bed sharing. Today I'm joined by my friend Amanda Jansen, who is a registered nurse in IVCLC, and she has eight years of L&D and postpartum experience as a nurse. So lots of knowledge, lots of wisdom today, and we're going to be talking about a taboo-ish topic, but I want you to kind of stay with us, stick with us with an open mind, really trying to hear the things that we are sharing with you. It may resonate with you. It may not resonate with you. Either way, I hope this conversation serves as something that will help you better understand your options when it comes to getting sound sleep for you and your family. So Amanda, first, welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so excited to finally be talking to you and yeah, sharing this kind of outside of the Instagram space. So Absolutely. You can tell that I'm super excited to jump in. I think this is a topic that a lot of people are interested in. They don't know where to get information. And there's a little bit of like shame and embarrassment or like you, you got to whisper about it in order to have these conversations. So let's start off with the very basics. What is bed sharing? And is it the same thing as coast? And when people say I co sleep, do they mean bed sharing or are they separate? Bed sharing, you know, obviously infants in the bed with you, co sleeping, you know, there's something right beside the bed, like kind of like an arm's reach. Let's talk about the whole um, ABCs. So the, you know, your baby is alone, they're mm-hmm. on their back and they're in a crib. Um, that's your ABCs of safe sleep that we all know in America. If you're going to do it, yeah, there definitely are things that need to be put in place to make it safe. No alcohol use, no drug use, um, no sedative medications. And then it needs to be like a primary caregiver. So mom, dad, both aware that baby's in bed. That's definitely something that I think a lot of parents maybe don't talk about. You know, if you've got a huge dad that's like, you know, sleeps like a bear and just like does not have any type of, um, you know, body awareness and body awareness. Exactly. So both parents have to be on board and agree. Um, And then this is one thing that unfortunately kind of in the bed sharing world, you know, you've either bed shared all with all your babies and you are still, you know, sometimes sharing that sleep space with a toddler. That toddler does definitely has no body awareness. So ideally, you know, until the infant is one, they should not be sleeping in a, in a, in a bed with an older sibling. Where your baby sleeps actually in the bed around the other adults in the bed matters as well. It does. So moms kind of have an instinctual position they get into, and it's been, you know, kind of coined or termed the C hold. So like, you know, knees are at an angle and you kind of have your arm around baby and they're snuggled in that perfect little spot that, you know, our bodies were made to, you know, either breastfeed or, you know, sleep in. Um, And so it really kind of just depends on like bed size, you know, size of the parents, you know, what, what you feel comfortable with. And then it is also really important to say babies should still be on their back um, when they're in bed. So I believe it was like in the eighties when the back to sleep campaign kind of took over the world, you know, that, that happened in Europe. It happened here. Um, you know, and we did, we decreased a ton of deaths just by putting babies on their back instead of on their belly. Not a lot of things in America work, but that one worked. Right. Like that one, it worked. And then we kind of just saw a stall and I'm, I'm, that's why I'm coming on and bringing this information to parents, because I feel like, you know, we've stalled out why are we still having deaths? You know, if we aren't going to take the conversation another way now. Um, and then we also know just breastfeeding in general decreases the risk. Um, and so that's where my conversation really shifted. You know, as an IBCLC, I saw moms, you know, they went back to work, either babies, you know, maybe started eating less during the day because of bottle refusal. And then their babies were cluster feeding, you know, at night and they were either going to wean altogether 
or, you know, they were dragging their tired bodies, you know, to a nursery, you know, three, four or five times a night. And it just was not, it's not sustainable. Um, and so that's where I think that, yeah, implementing the safer steps, um, if you choose, you know, to continue to breastfeed, um, should be a valid option. And I just, I wasn't able to really give that to parents in the hospital setting. And so that's kind of what I do now in my private practice. Um, it's just bring the information, of course, you know, parents make that decision for, you know, them and their family. Um, and we, we just go with it. So. Can we also talk about the point that it doesn't have to be something that you like choose and stick with? Like while your children are sick, you can oh, bed yeah. share and co-sleep, but once they're well, put them back in their crib that is beside your bed. If your okay. baby starts teething, co-sleep for a couple nights, bed share for a couple nights. And once that tooth is broken through and they're back to sleeping, yeah. put them in their crib next to your bed. You don't have to choose something and stick with it, right? Exactly. Like, you can use this to your advantage. If you're sick or you go out drinking, put your baby in the crib for that night and resume yeah. bed sharing the next night. I think the bottom line is that abstinence only doesn't work because people aren't going to not do it. They're still going to do it. They're just going to do it unsafely. And so it's really important to provide people with a space that they can get solid evidence-based honest and transparent information about things that maybe aren't mainstream, like ABC sleeping, um, so that they can do it safely. So, uh, I love that you touched on, talked about, touched on, um, the SIDS rate when it comes to, to bed sharing. And then you mentioned that your baby needs to be on their back. How about swaddling? Can we still swaddle a baby while we bed share, especially in those newborn days, that first eight to 12 weeks while they're really not rolling, but they could use that sensory input during sleep? Mm -hmm. It's not recommended that they be swaddled. Um, sure. I don't, and my, my opinion on swaddles might be a little bit different than yours. Sure. Um, there is that exaggerated you know, reflex that can startle baby awake. Um, but when you're alone and in a crib and, you know, you're startled awake, it's so much different than I, uh, I could go into, you know, energy and just the closeness, yeah. you know, being yeah. against another human yeah. that is so much more subtle, you know, in a, in a bed sharing, um, space. Um, so it's not recommended that they swaddle. They could be in a sleep sack, you know, if you want their feet contained, um, but their arms actually should be unrestricted. Um, and there's a little bit of, I mean, there's, you know, some professionals that are kind of looking into the swaddle and the, the snoo, you know, of course yes. <laughs> I, I could go on about the snoo, yes. but being able to actually integrate those reflexes. So they're not, um, they actually can come out of that exaggerated startle reflex faster with an unswaddled approach. It seems like parents almost take the place of the swaddle. If you have that closeness, I would also assume mm -hmm. that your baby's probably reaching to you during the night or they're touching yeah, you. Kind of have that the night. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they get the same sensory input. It just is in a different way. Um, you know, arguably for some people, a better way because um, yeah. it's human, human connection and input rather than from a swaddle. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then you touched on how bed sharing can help support your breastfeeding um, relationship, but is there anything else that we need to know about bed sharing and um, breastfeeding in particular? Like you will fall asleep at some point with your baby if you're breastfeeding, especially lying down. But that's why I think so many people love this is because honestly, I can say like, even with a four week old, I feel rested every single morning. Like it's, it's kind of amazing. Like that shift just of not having to drag yourself out of bed and walk to a separate room to feed in a separate space. Um, and I think that's important because you know, sleep deprivation can cause so, you know, so many issues. If you want to start going down the maternal mental health, you know, route, like it's huge. And that's why we're postpartum doulas because we know that sleep is important for, um, for families. 
Um, but I will, while we're kind of on that topic, if you are so sleep deprived, like even as a mom, even as a breastfeeding mom, there are, you know, some instances where we need to be more careful. If you are to that point where you just cannot even carry a conversation, you are so tired that's probably not the time to start bed sharing. Yeah, you know, sleep deprivation will absolutely impact your healing too. So I think if you're in a bind and, you know, maybe a, a doula isn't within your means to have, have your partner get up and go get your baby and bring them to you, yeah. right? Um, it's also an option for you to set up camp in your baby's nursery. Get, you may not have um, like a whole full blow up mattress, but get all the pillows and the blankets and the towels in your room and set up camp and get, you know, a nice sleep, put a, a couch in your baby's room, the, ask for a futon. You've got lots of options. There are ways that you can absolutely reduce the amount of time that you spend out of bed and awake. Um, but yeah, sleep deprivation is huge. So just to set the scene for everyone, some of the benefits of not having to get out of the bed is, you know, let's say you're laying in bed with your baby, um, bed sharing, and they start to rouse because they're hungry. You don't get out of bed. You don't have to turn on the light. You don't have to get really situated. You just get situated enough to get a boob in their mouth and yeah. they're already on their back. You keep it yeah. dark. So you don't, um, you know, you don't kind of get your baby more awake than they really need to be you don't have to get more awake than you really need to be um I think for me as a doula that's why I hear the most people say that they choose to bed chair it's just easier um and it's fascinating to hear that you get more sleep with your baby right next to you because I too hear that a lot is they just sleep deeper knowing that their baby is right there even though they are so educated and well aware of the risk of bed sharing it's actually why they choose to do it is because that deep sleep, that sound sleep for both them and their baby, the ease of it all, the way that it does support them getting more rest and their breastfeeding. Those are all the reasons that people are choosing to safely bed share. Is there anything else that you want us to know about bed sharing? I think that takeaway is just, you know, yeah, seek out the information and seek out the resources if something just intuitively does not feel good for you. There's a whole community of, you know, sleep trainers and there's a whole community of, you know, the hippie crunchy, you know, bed sharers. But if it, it really does need to be a choice that comes from like within, like something's not working. So how, yeah, how do I get the information and how do I make this informed decision? Um, so I can feel confident doing it. Oh my gosh, Amanda, this has been an amazing conversation. I really, really appreciate it. So if people wanted to reach out to you, follow you, connect with you, work with you, learn more about bed sharing from you, how can they do that? And where can they find you? So I am on Instagram. So Midwest Mama Collective. So um, I'm based out of Kansas, but I can do virtual consults basically anywhere. Um, my website is midwestmamacollective.com. Email is hello at Midwest Mama Collective. So it basically is just me. It's just me at this point. Um, and I, again, have kind of transitioned from the hospital birth center space and I'm doing more private, you know, birth support, postpartum support and lactation support. And I mean, sleep just is intertwined in all of that. That's my jam. That's the name of the game around here. All right, you guys. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Earth Launch Podcast. I will see you next week. But until then, head over to our Instagram at Tranquility by Hehe and give us a follow there. Or you can find us on YouTube. It's Tranquility by Hehe there as well. Bye. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you next time on the Birth Launch Podcast. Until then, head over to Instagram and find us at Tranquility by Hehe and give us a follow. You can also check us out at thebirthlounge.com.